What got me into commercial real estate was I started, you know, just investing in residential real estate. And when I first started, you know, investing in residential real estate, you know, I was doing a ton of it. And um, I kept saying to myself, you know, I, I, it really happened, I would say, when I got really, I was in a flip and the flip was going well, like financially, but it was just so time consuming. And I thought to myself, okay, you know, maybe there's a better way to do this, you know, that's more scalable and, um, you know, it was more worthwhile and I can make more money doing it ultimately. And that's how I, you know, come across large scale, you know, multifamily apartments. Um, and when I talk about, you know, large scale multifamily apartments, um, you know, typically what we were looking at was 50, 75 plus unit complexes. And when I first came across those, you know, my first thing was, okay, I'm brokering and selling a lot of real estate. That's pretty time consuming. Can I also get involved in uh, just passively investing in somebody else's deals? And that's how I had come across these deals at first. And I passively invested in them from about 2015 to 2018. And then in 2018, I partnered up with a couple guys and then we started you know, buying deals ourselves at that point in time. Uh, long story short, fast forward to 2024 and here we are. We haven't uh, bought anything in about two years at this point, just because the numbers have been, you know, tough to pencil. Um, but we certainly are are always looking for sure. Awesome. Um, and uh, yeah, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, where where do you practice primarily? I mean, I guess you might have commercial real estate all across the country. But where's where's HQ? And yeah. uh, and uh, any any other things people should know about you before we get started with the class. Yeah, so HQ for us is Dallas and Houston. My two partners live in Dallas and Houston. Uh, those are two, you know, the two markets that we really specialize and focus on. Um, they're two strong markets as far as like population growth, wage growth, economic growth, you know, landlord friendly state, of course. Um, I live in New Jersey, which is a state where you could actually squat in somebody's house and you could break into somebody's house. And, uh, you know, the, the police could come and they could actually kick you, the owner of the house, out if that person claims that they're actually a tenant and they've drawn up a fake lease, which is ridiculous. So in Texas, it's a little bit different. We say it's like a no pay, no stay type of state. Um, so, you know, if somebody's not paying, you could evict them. You don't got to deal with the bullshit in the courts and whatnot. So eh, that's a big piece of, you know, why we focus down there too. Uh, my two partners, you know, live in Dallas and Houston. So that's a big part of it as well. Um, but yeah, you know, a, a variety of factors, you know, led to us focusing on that. And, you know, me, you know, getting to know guys in Dallas and Houston, because that's where I wanted to do deals. And that's how I ultimately met my partners. Awesome. Awesome. Well, hey, for, 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 uh, he's very humble guys, but um, for, for an inspiration to all the young professionals on the, on the wire today, uh, he's also a, a 30 under 30 win winner through NAR, which is probably one of the most prestigious uh, recognitions that you can probably get, uh, for under the age of 30. Um, so that's, that's a pretty big deal. And, um, and yeah, man, it's, it's been cool to, to meet him in different conferences and everything else like that. Um, so when we were at, had our board of directors meeting in Q1, um, a, a fellow winner, Marcelo said, uh, we had to have you, man. So we're super excited to have you. So, uh, tell us more about why multifamily, uh, commercial real estate and, um, will we experience a, a flash crash? I hope not. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> interesting class. Thanks. Yeah, appreciate it. So here's what it all kind of, you know, goes back to. Um, obviously, interest rates hiked significantly over the past few years compared to where they were previously. But the issue is that with commercial real estate, a lot of the purchases are done on floating rate debt. So there's people who originally bought deals, let's call it three years ago, when they were taking out mortgages at 3% rates, and you were going floating rate. And since interest rates were effectively at zero, your interest rate was 3%. Well, floating rate debt, the way it works is typically you get a spread plus SOFR. SOFR tracks with Fed funds. So Fed funds today is around like 5.5%. I think it's like 5.4, somewhere around there. So if your spread, like a tra traditional spread would be like 3.3%. So if you had a 3.3% spread and Fed funds was zero, you basically a 3.3% rate. Well, now when Fed funds is around like, let's say 54 well, 3.3 plus 5.4 means your rate is close to 9% now. So the numbers just don't really work. Now, the way to mitigate that risk is you buy, you know, like a rate hedge. And a rate hedge is basically, you know, in the form of a rate cap. And you might buy a rate cap for like a two-year term at a 1% at a strike. Now, what does that mean? What that basically means is that your 3.3 spread is capped at an additional 1%, which would mean that net effectively your rate can't go over 43 which is still a very good interest rate. 
The problem is people are holding these, these loans, we call them holding it naked. And what we mean holding it naked and what we mean by that is that they don't have rate caps on them. They don't have those hedges on them. So their rates now effectively have jumped to 9%. Now, this is all while, you know, we have excess new supply hitting the market. Remember, COVID slowed a lot of things down as far as supply chain was concerned. So a lot of the builders, you know, built up a big backlog. And then once the supply chain eased up, everything got built at once. So this year, in 2024, we have record new deliveries of apartments nationwide. And nationwide, what that has led to is flat rent growth year over year. Despite the fact demand is really high, supply is even higher. So you're having flat rent growth. You're having rising expenses from things like insurance, property taxes, repairs and maintenance, and general inflation of everything, right? So your expenses have gone up. Um, you're having to compete with all these other new apartments around you, so occupancy is lower. And it's really ultimately created kind of this perfect storm in a bad way. Uh, perfect storm in a bad way of you know loans that are hitting a maturity, and they either have to refi or sell, but refining is a bad option. Selling is even a worse option. So they're basically having to figure out, what do we do here? And a lot of them don't have an option to do anything else but be forced to sell and perhaps be forced to sell and wipe out all the equity of their investors in that deal. They don't have a choice because the lender won't let them kick the can down the road any further. So I'll go over a bunch of charts here, kind of explaining exactly. And Kevin, I just want to confirm everybody can, you can see my screen here. And you know, the screen that says why multifamily CRE will experience a flash crash. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's nicely, nicely designed. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Thank you. Um, so starting off it. with this first slide here, this is just a little bit about me. We don't need to go too much into this. I introduced myself already. But I, I go back to this here. And when I say I go back to this, let's talk about, you know, the good times, right? This was a property we bought in 2019 in Arizona, in Glendale, right outside Phoenix. So we bought this property, 120 units, 11.635 million. And we wound up holding it for about three and a half years. We sold this in November of 2022 for $25 million. We spent roughly only about $800,000 worth of renovations here. So we were sunk on this for close to about $12.5 million, and we sold it for $25 million. Again, now, this is not to say we weren't good operators. We were good operators. We kept occupancy high. We grew income. We kept expenses in check and things like that. But you don't buy a property for, you know, about eleven and a half million and then sell it, you know, for twenty five million in three and a half years, unless the market has really helped you. And the market did really help us here in this circumstance. You know, interest rates went down, cap rates went down. And when cap rates go down, values go up. So what wind up happening here is our investors, these numbers are actually <clears throat> off and I have to amend these, but equity multiple wind up being close to four X. And what that means that an investor who invested a hundred grand in this deal, their hundred turned into four hundred thousand dollars roughly over the course of just three and a half years. So I call this between 2012 to 2021 the good times. Now, the good times I tell everybody, and I don't care if you know people don't like when I say this, but the you know, click basically the qualifications to be a good investor was that you had a pulse, and I put here a shallow pulse. You really didn't need much of a pulse. If you bought you could have actually poorly managed the property. Income could have gone down. Collections would have gone down. But again, because interest rates went so low, that juiced the values. And you were able to sell for these huge numbers. Now, what this also led to was people who did good on these deals, like somebody who might have 2x money on this deal in three and a half years look good. But reality was, if you actually dove into the numbers on some of them, they were really you know poor and really poorly operated. Now, for us, fortunately, you know, again, we were able to 4x our money because- not only did the market help us, but we were good operators here too, keeping occupancy close to 100% at all times, growing income. We doubled the rents over the course of three years. We kept expenses in check. Arizona's great as far as like tax situation. They didn't have to worry too much about property taxes. But again, what you have now, you know, the bad times, right? The bad times 2022 to present. Again, interest rate hikes. Today, you know, at, at 2.30 is the, is the Fed, you know, uh, press conference with Jay Powell, right? And Jay Powell, you know, the head of the Fed, has been continuously, you know, raising rates over the course of two years. Now, they haven't hiked rates in months and months and months at this point now. But again, we don't know when they're going to cut. And when they cut, that will be a good signal to the market that, you know, money's going to, you know, as far as interest rates, the spreads are going to, you know, get, get tighter. Interest rates are going to go lower. And we're ultimately going to be all good. But right now, we don't know when that's going to be. So to get to how we got here, right, you had historic rise in interest rates. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Cap rate expan expansion. Anybody here watching this who deals with investors, you know that when you're selling a property, you want to sell at the lowest cap rate possible. 
And when you're buying a property, you want to buy at the highest cap rate possible. And again, the reason is because cap rates and values are inversely correlated. When cap rates go down, values go up. When cap rates go up, not so good because values go down, right? Another issue we're dealing with is flat rents because of the excess new supply coming on the market, rising expenses, loan maturities. I don't think people are really have any idea what that's going to do to the market. Um, this right now, what we are in right now, just as you know, 2008 had you know wiped out and really crushed residential real estate like single family homes. This, in my opinion, is actually worse than 2000 than the 2008 financial crisis for commercial real estate. Um, residential real estate, one to four family homes are completely fine. There's really no distress there because of you know QM laws and things like that. But this right now for commercial real estate, this is commercial real estate's 2008. Again, residential, one to four family, fine. Commercial, it's about to be a total bloodbath here. Um, and then what are the options that people have? Refinance, seller, default. Again, no really good options. So we'll talk about what that looks like. So here's how it started, right? Again, I have this famous quote from Jay Powell, the head of the Fed back in summer 2021. He had this infamous quote, in the end, it, meaning inflation, will be transitory. Now that's the joke that people talk about all the time because right after he said that, what happened to inflation? Just skyrocketed to the point where it got towards 9%, right? And then what wound up happening? They started jacking rates. If you look at the end of 2021, the Fed every three months or so puts out their dot plots. Their dot plots is where do we see our Fed funds interest rate being over the next, again, three, four years and long-term you know, forward from there. If you look at this, you'll see at the end of 2022, and remember, they put out this dot plot the very end of 2021. They said at the end of 2022, we're not even gonna hit 1%. At the end of 2023, we're going to be about 1.5%. At the end of 2024, we'll maybe hit just above 2%. And longer term average, we'll keep it around 2.5%. What wound up happening? We get into 2022, fastest rise of interest rates ever. And that Fed funds today, again, it's higher than you know what they said, 1%. It's higher than 1.5%. It's higher than 2%. It's, at, it's in you know it's range bound between 5.25% and 5.5. The problem is people bought deals baking this into their numbers, saying this is what the Fed tells us they're going to do with interest rates. Take it a step further. How's it going now? So this is the Fed's dot plot they put out in September. Ironically, today, this very day, they are releasing their new dot plot at, I believe, two o'clock. So in the next hour or so. But in September of this year, they said, look, we're going to end 2023 about 5.5, which is where we are right now. We're going to end 2024 around 5%. And again, we're going to end 2025 around 4%. Totally changed, totally flipped on its head. The problem is, again, for the investors, they care about this. The Fed's like, not our problem, right? And again, but this is what has led to all this distress because when you're on that floating rate debt, typically the way that works, it's like a two or three year loan, right? And then you have two additional one year extensions built in. Let's say somebody was on a two year floating rate bridge loan. That means they took out that loan, let's say hypothetically, in uh, in January of 2022. You get to January of 2024, in order to get that extension for that extra year to push out the maturity, you have to meet certain tests. Now, those certain tests could be what's called a debt yield test, where you take your income divided by the loan balance and it has to hit a certain number, or a DCR test, which is your debt service coverage ratio. And typically that's about 1.25x. What does that mean? That means your monthly debt service multiply that times 1.25. And that must be the minimum income that your property is generating after expenses. In other words, your NOI, net operating income. The problem is since expenses have gone up and since rents went flat, very, very, very few properties qualify for that. And now the bank's calling the loan due and they have to sell when we're at peak interest rates, when rents are flat, when expenses went up, when income dropped. So they're being forced to fire sale. If you look at some of these deals that sold, let's say, two years ago versus the prices right now. And you had no idea. You just woke up from a coma and you're like, wow, why are they selling at such steep discounts? Again, the reason why that's happening is because they're being forced to sell right now. Traditionally, they, these people wouldn't sell right now. They would just, you know, hold off on selling, but they're being forced to sell because of loan maturity. They have no choice other than to do that. And again, we all know this, you know, the Fed moved at a historically fast rate to tame inflation, <clears throat> but here's really a great example, right? Let's say two years ago, somebody bought this deal. 100 million bucks, as you see on the left side here. And they raised uh, uh, 35 million worth of equity. 
they took out a $65 million loan. If we just assume that their income stayed the same, which in a lot of cases, their income went lower because again, rents went flat over the past year plus and expenses went up. We're using this example, assuming that income just stayed the same, stayed level. What would happen here is that if you now figure out the new property value and you use the cap rate and you assume that, hey, I bought here at a cap rate in the fours and now I have to you know, uh, refi here when cap rates are in the, um, in the sixes, what is the difference here? Well, that would drop your market value from 100 million to 72 million. So if you go to refi this, a lender is going to say, look, we're willing to lend you money at 65% loan to value ratio, right? Well, 65% of the current value of 72 million is only 46.8 million. It's only 46.8 million, right? So <clears throat> what you have to do now is you got to bring rescue capital to the table. The equity in the property of 35 million is now only worth 7 million. Put that into perspective, $100,000 investor, their 100 grand is now only worth 20,000. And then on top of that, they have to bring an extra you know, rescue capital to the table. If they can find it, the odds of them finding it's probably slim. If they can find it for about 18.2 million. So for their investor who put 100 grand into the deal, you know, 18.2 is roughly about half of 35 million. They would be asking a hundred thousand dollar investor, "Hey, give me an extra fifty grand so we can kick the can down the road, so we could extend this loan, so we can refinance." Again, and then it becomes a situation where somebody's asking themselves, "Do I want to throw good money after bad, or do I just want to cut my losses and get out and just realize, you know, it sucks, you know, but I lost money here." This is what's happening right now. And this property here, the biggest thing that changed was really just the fact that interest rates went up and cap rates, you know, uh, followed suit. Because when cap rates go up, as you see here, values go down. It's the biggest issue that we're dealing with right now, you know, in this space. And this is why you're starting to see slowly, but it's starting to speed up a little now, more and more foreclosures hitting the market. This property, uh, actually yesterday, story came out, property in Fort Worth, 620-ish units. They defaulted on their loan. Their occupancy went went down to like 60%. I posted about it on my um on my Twitter, I'll, I'll put my uh, Twitter at the end here just so you guys can see that. But again, got foreclosed on. And those were two operators who were like, you know, 10 plus year operators in that market. So it's th th this issue is not, you know, discriminating against whether you're new, whether you're old in the business. This issue is happening pretty widespread right now. And it's going to get publicly very, very bad soon. I, you know, I would say in the next 12 to 18 months, this is all you're going to be hearing about. And again, what did I say? Again, rents went flat. So that's your revenue stream, your main revenue stream. But all while that occurred, again, expenses went up. So again, rents went flat year over year, below 1% for the, only the second time since 2010. RealPage puts out great data on all this. That's where this is from here. And again, why did rents go flat? We talked about this already because new construction went through the roof. And when you have new supply hitting the market, and again, it's putting downward pressure on the competitive properties that are 10, 20, 30 years old, because now you're having to compete with, for tenants with a new property versus your older property. Um, and again, you could see here, there is a direct correlation between new supply and rent growth. Markets, as you see here, that added more than 10% of supply. Now, what's that 10% mean? That's 10% of total housing stock. So let's say there was 1,000 apartments in the market. To add 10% or more would mean adding 100 or more, because 100 is you know 10% of that 1,000 total stock, right? So in markets that added 10% or more to their existing supply, their rent is down year over year, you know, close to 2%. For markets that barely added any supply, their rent's still up, you know, 2.75% year over year. So one thing that I would say is important when you're looking for any investment properties, especially these commercial investment properties, multifamily wise, figure out what's the new construction pipeline in like the three mile radius around the property. You know, you want to be in a market where there's, you know, huge barriers of entry because when you have stagnant supply and increasing demand, that, that's great. If supply is low, demand's high, prices go up. As a landlord, that's wonderful, right? And again, as I said, the reason for flat rents, not a demand issue, demand sky high. You know, in, in Q4 of 2023, we had near the highest demand of all time for apartments, nearly set a record. The reason why rents were still flat though is because supply was highest of all time. So if supply was just at normal levels and we had this level of demand, rent growth would be skyrocketing. Here's the thing though, the supply is falling off a cliff. New permits for multifamily construction nationwide down close to 50% year over year 
That's forward-looking data about 18 months out because when you get that permit, it typically takes 18 to 24 months to actually build it. So we already know in 18 to 24 months, supplies falling off a cliff, all this demand you know, remains high because we have the most amount of 30 to 39-year-olds in the country ever alive right now. And that's a peak household formation decade for people, right? So we can already see what's going to happen. And that's why I say to myself when I'm looking at deals right now, shit, if I buy a deal this year, I'm going to look like a genius because in two, three, four years, when I bought that deal at a higher cap rate and interest rates then went down from today to let's say 2028, when I project that rates will probably be lower than what they are today, cap rates go down, supply has gone down, rent growth has gone up. I'm going to be sitting pretty on that property and you know, we'll be able to sell it or refi and pull some cash out. And people are going to be like, wow, you guys operated that so well. No, you know, again, we could operate it very well. We plan on doing so, but it's also going to be because the market is going to significantly help us and play in our favor because we could already see what's going to happen with supply. But supply tanks, but demand is high, prices go up. And that's what you're going to see in about 18 to 24 months here. Furthermore, you look at this, not a demand issue. Why isn't it? Right now, it's significantly more expensive to own a home versus rent on a monthly basis, on a pure monthly basis. If you look nationwide, nationwide here, and this was back in, you know, uh, 2023 here, um, it was roughly, if you calculate the numbers, about seven dollars $800. So the exact number is seven sixty three dollars less per month to rent versus own the same housing unit because of where interest rates are and where prices happen to be. So again, a lot of people are opting to rent right now versus buy. People have this idea, oh, prices are going to, you know, totally tank and, you know, drop 30, 40% single family homes. They are insane. That's not going to happen. Um, but these people have these dreams and these ideas It will happen. So they're renting in the interim and they're just going to miss the boat because they're going to be like, shit, I should have bought because prices kept going up on single family homes. But this is, again, another reason why demand is super, super high for rentals. Furthermore, you look at this again. Apartment demand, again, continues to go up. I don't need to keep going over this stuff here. But here's just another perfect example. So of the 50 largest metros in the country, <clears throat> there's only four cities where the average renter, based on their income, could actually afford the median starter home. So the 50 biggest metros in the country, there's only four cities where your average renter, based on their median income, can afford the median starter home. Those four cities, Detroit, Tulsa, Memphis, Oklahoma City. Furthermore, 13 of those 50 metros, they earn less than 50% of the annual income to qualify for the median starter home. Like for instance, I, I'm, I live in uh, right outside New York City and in the New York metro area, my area here, your average renter only makes 34% of the money that they would need to earn to buy your median starter home. I'm not talking a, a, a mansion. I'm talking your median starter home. And the two markets I'm active in, Dallas and Houston, your average renter, is only making 69 and 68% of the income that would be needed to buy your median, again, starter home. So this is why, again, demand for rentals is you know sky high because people, they need houses to live in. They need apartments to live in. And if you can't afford to buy, you got to live somewhere. Unless you're living with family, you're going to be renting somewhere. And here's the reason why rent growth is you know, going to be roaring back as we get to the latter half of 2025 and into 2026. New permits for construction has fallen off a cliff. In the southern part of the country, new permits for new construction for building apartments is down nearly 72% year over year. Nationwide, close to 50%. So when you look at this, you say, okay, well, the new supply is going to, you know, the spigot's getting turned off. The new supply is basically done, you know, well below historic, you know, averages. Once we get towards the end of 2025, as we get into 2026, all while demand remains increasingly high. Because again, the millennials in their 30s right now, biggest generation in US history, the baby boomers kids. The generation following them, Gen Z, is not too small either. They're a very large generation as well. So what you're seeing is you have this natural built-in demographic demand just from people being alive and breathing because they need somewhere to live. All while, again, housing costs have gone up, so a lot of them can't afford to buy. Instead, they're renting. All while, again, new permits and new supplies falling off a cliff. So you could always, again, people think it's like me making predictions. This isn't a prediction. This is a fact. And the reason I say it's a fact, because all you have to do is follow the permits. The permits literally tell you factually how many new apartments will be built. And when that falls off a cliff and demand remains high due to natural demographic demand, and, you know, excluding a, a nuke hitting the country and, you know, killing a bunch of 30 to 39-year-olds, again, 
once you get towards the end of 2025 into 2026, rent growth takes off and you bought that deal in 2024, you're going to be sitting pretty saying, that looked pretty smart right now because you bought it at a really good basis, really good price. Rent growth went up, expenses normalized, but you were able to buy it back in 2024 when, you know, shit hit the fan. But now you get into 2026, you're like, damn, I look good, right? So again, you can see it here, you know, as far as like rent growth. Again, part of this, and the biggest piece of this is supplies falling off a cliff. You simply look at this here. And what does it show you? New, new deliveries. 2024, most amount of apartments ever that will be built in this country in a single year ever. Prior to, you know, maybe in the future, there will be another year. But 657,000, the most ever. We get into 2025, that begins to fall. And as you get to the latter half of the year, it really, really begins to fall. And then as you get into 2026, it really, really falls, right? So <clears throat> this, this is why rent growth, again, is we're going to roar back when you get towards the end of 2025 into 2026 here. Again, it's just natural supply and demand. People try to overcomplicate things, I think, a lot of times, but supply and demand tells the whole story here. And this just shows you, again, if you look at the three largest age cohorts in the country right now, it's anywhere between the ages of 25 to 39. And what's your peak household formation age in renters? Between 25 and 39. So again, you're leading into this on the other end of the storm, the other end of the perfect storm. Or if you buy this year and you get into twenty latter half of 2025 into 2026, you have this natural built-in enormous demand all while the supply falls off a cliff. And again, we talked about, again, the people who have to sell this year, they're so fucked. And I'm sorry, excuse my language. I know it's not an appropriate word to use, but I really have to just express that they are so screwed. And the reason why, rents went flat, expenses went up, now net operating income went down. And here's part of the reason why, you know, net operating income went down because rents were flat and they dealt with these expense increases. Property insurance up 36%. Repairs and maintenance up 19%. All operating expenses across the board up 18% over the course of two years. Rents went flat, expenses went up 18%. Not a good situation to be in if you have to sell while interest rates went up, while cap rates went up. Your income went down, cap rates went up. If you have to sell, you're in a really bad spot. So hopefully uh, people have the ability to push off selling. That would always be ideal. You'd rather sell at a better time than a worse time. But the people who have to sell right now are in a really, really precarious spot. And a lot of them, unfortunately, they're getting foreclosed on because they couldn't even find a buyer if they went to sell. Because if they went to sell, they couldn't even sell for the, you know, the debt, the loan value of the property. So it's a really bad spot for people. But again, on the other side of that, there's opportunity. The opportunity is if you're on the buyer side of the table. On the buyer side of the table, you buy these deals, you know, you're going to get, you know, I, I don't want to promise anybody gets those returns like I showed you on that deal in Arizona that we did back in 2019 and sold in uh, 2022. But I think there's a chance that, you know, you could see deals like that again. And here's the biggest reason why these people are forced to sell loan maturities. So 1.5 trillion of the 4.5 trillion of outstanding commercial real estate debt matures by the end of 2025. Now of that 682 billion is a multifamily. So some of these will be able to get loan extensions and, you know, kick that can down the road. Some of them won't be able to get loan extensions. Some of them will be forced to sell. And those that are forced to sell, what's unique about these maturities and what's unique about this distress, typically when we hear distress, we think uh, high vacancy, you know, poorly operated property. You can have properties right now, very well operated. You would go on the property, know that nothing's wrong. 95% occupancy, everybody's happy there. Tenants are taken care of, but they hit a loan maturity. And due to hitting that maturity wall, shit has hit the fan. And now they're forced to sell or get foreclosed on or hit up their investors, ask them for money to put money into the deal to kick the can down the road. Neither of which are good, you know, none of those are good options. So if they can't raise money internally from their investors, they're going to be forced to sell because they're not going to qualify for a refinance. Again, based on the example that we showed earlier, you know, when somebody tried to refinance after buying for 100 million, and now it's only worth 72 million. You can't refinance unless you hit up your investors, ask them to bring a ton of cash to the table. So loan maturity is the reason why these people have to sell. And the reason why, in my opinion, we are going to see this flash crash. When I say flash crash, what do I mean, by the way? A short-term crash. Because once maturity wall is done, everybody who buys the properties are going to be sitting pretty. Because as we talked about, rent growth roars back latter half of 2025 into 2026. And when that happens, everybody's sitting pretty. But the people who have to sell right now, 
and there's a select group of them, right? 682 billion potentially worth of loans. They're in a really precarious spot. And here's an example just to show you the problem laid out, right? Five years ago, you could have bought an apartment complex at 80% loan to value ratio, which for simplicity's sake would mean if you bought it for uh, uh, 10 million bucks, you're taking it a loan for 8 million. So five years ago, you could have bought at 80% loan to value ratio, four and a half percent rate, flexible on the on the DSCR, your debt service coverage ratio. And just to explain what that means here, debt service coverage ratio, I have it you know defined at the bottom. So it's just taking your net op uh, net operating income divided by the debt service. So as an example here, see this uh, this last bullet point. If your property had 125,000 in net operating income and your debt service, like your monthly mortgage payment, was a hundred thousand dollars. In that case, you'd have a 1.25 DCR. So th they used to be a little bit more flexible with the DSCRs. And five years ago, you had steady rent growth, right? Go to bullet point two. Today, what do you have? Today, most lenders will lend you at most 65% loan to value ratio. You're, you're getting like six and a half percent rates. You know, you need at least in a lot of cases, 1.25x DSCRs. You're having flat rent growth and growing expenses, right? So let's lay this out to you. You know, what's the problem? Let's say monthly debt service on a $10 million loan at a four and a half percent interest rate with interest only payments is 37,225 today. Which would mean if you have a one point, uh, excuse me, a 1.5 DSCR, your monthly NOI is 55,837, right? Now, most people looking at that deal, if they were invested in that deal and they're owning that deal, they're saying, we're doing great. You know, our, our debt, our monthly mortgage is covered by 1.5X. Here's the problem if they hit a loan maturity. They hit a loan maturity today and they have to refinance that $10 million loan at a 6.5% interest rate. That would mean that your monthly debt service now Again, 10 million at six and a half percent is 53,892. So your income is still the same. If your monthly NOI is 55,837, they're not going to qualify you to refinance because it's 55,837, 1.25x more than 53,892. No, it's not. So again, they won't qualify you for the refinance for the whole amount because, again, at that DSCR, you're only at 1.04, which is well below the 1.25. With that being said, what will they qualify you for in a refinance? So as you see here with their current NOI, which we explained in bullet point one of 55,837, the most a lender will lend to them is at a $44,670 monthly mortgage payment between principal and interest. And again, I'm actually being friendly here, just saying it's only interest payments only. This is like as friendly as you can get on this because if I did principal and interest, they'd be whacked. I'm just using interest here just to be super, super friendly to this example. All right. So now 55,837, their income divided by 44,670 gives you a DCR of 1.25X. So again, 44,670 monthly debt service with interest only payments would mean they would only give you a loan for 8.3 million bucks. But you need to refinance 10 million. So what does that mean? That means you have to hit up your investors and ask them to bring an additional 1.7 million to the table. So if you bought this deal five years ago, $10 million loan, and you bought it for 12.5 million, that means that there's roughly about 2.5 million in equity in that deal when you purchased. So if you have to ask them for $1.7 million to bring to the table, that means that for your average $100,000 investor, you're asking them to bring $68,000 to the table to be able to refinance. Because again, the way the numbers work here, 1.7 million divided by 2.5 million is 68%. So $100,000 investor, 68% of that is 68,000. So you're in a tough spot. Um, in that situation. And what might very well wind up happening if they can't get that money, they're going to be forced to sell or get foreclosed on. And this is like a nice example. This isn't even like that, uh, that much of a distressed example here. And I'm not even talking about somebody with like a 3% interest rate. I'm talking about just going from 4.5 to 6.5. But I'll show you what happens with the other interest rates, right? So we take this into account. You know, I went over this example already. So furthermore, let's... uh. Let's give this example here. What's the takeaway? 
Any loan that has an interest rate of 4.5%, if they were to refinance at 6.5%, they'd have to have a DCR of at least 1.81. If your current interest rate was 4% and you had to refinance today at 6.5% rates, in order to qualify for the refinance, your debt service coverage ratio has got to be 2.04 or more. What does that mean? That means if your monthly debt service was $100,000, you'd have to be generating $204,000 worth of NOI every single month. I could tell you from experience that typically with investors, once your DSCR gets even close to two, they're like, hey, why aren't you refinancing? Why aren't you pulling money out of the deal to put it back in our pockets? This is a waste of you know stagnant equity. Take it a step further. I'm sure you guys know people who bought properties at three and a half percent rates you know, years ago. Any loan with an interest rate of three and a half percent, we need a current DSCR of 2.33 or higher to qualify to refinance at 6.5% rates. And lastly, any loan with an interest rate of 3% would need a DSCR of 2.72 or higher to qualify to refinance at 6.5%. The situation that I'm laying out here is dire. It is dire. And trust me, I'm not the type. That's like the doom and gloom type. For those of you who know me, and I know some of you know me who are on this right now, I infamously in June of 2022 made a YouTube video and you can look it up. Just there's a timestamp on it the day I posted it saying why the residential real estate market was not in a bubble. Everybody, if you remember, in June of 2022, May of 2022, when interest rates started going like this, we're like, everything is going to crash. I was like, one to four family, you know, real estate's fine. It's really no issue. And everybody's like, you're an idiot. Why would you make this video? Because it's the truth. I just follow the data. The truth is the exact opposite in commercial real estate right now. It's, I don't even know how to express this because I talk about this with some people and they're, they they want to be so optimistic on this. This is bad. This is really bad. Um, but when things are bad like this, it's bad for sellers. It's good for buyers. So if you're able to take advantage of this and hop in on these and take advantage of these opportunities and buy these properties, you're going to make money hand over fist. But the people who have to sell right now, they are so, so screwed. Um, I, I don't even know how to really quant you know put it into words how screwed they are. So... As we talked about, you know, what's their situation here? They got to refinance, sell, or default, um, none of which are good options. Uh, now, if you refinance and you have a lot of equity in the property and you can qualify for actually a cash out refinance, well, that's fine. But for people who bought two years ago, three years ago, a lot of them, if they refinance, they got to bring cash to the table. So, you know, to give you guys an example on this here. So we have some deals that have um, floating rate debt as well but we bought, bought them at more conservative leverage. We didn't buy them at like, you know, 90% leverage or anything like that. And on top of that, we bought rate caps, but to really lay it out to you, and you know, we, we're a group that buys rate caps. If we ever have floating rate debt, you see this bullet point three. In September, 2021, we bought a property, has roughly a $25 million loan on it. And we bought a two-year rate cap at a 1% strike and it only cost us $33,000. So what does that mean? Our spread on that is 3.3%. By buying a 1% rate cap, that means over those first two years of owning that property, our interest rate can never go over 4.3. Well, that rate cap just expired in September of 2023. We had to buy a new rate cap. The new rate cap we bought was just for one year and at a 2% strike, which means now our interest rate can never exceed 5.3%. That 2% strike for just one year cost us over $800,000. We went from buying a two-year 1% strike for $33,000 to buying a one-year 2% strike for over $800,000. Now, again, fortunate for us, this property has been a cash cow for us, and we had the cash on hand to do that. There's a lot of groups that don't have that cash on hand to do things like that. So again, like, what, what have we done once interest rates skyrocketed? Like, We paused our distributions, our cash flow distributions to our investors. We said, look, until we have any guidance from the Fed that the Fed is actively cutting rates, we need to build up capital for purposes of you know being able to buy rate hedges. Because what they said when we bought this deal was that you know by the time we got to 2024, th their Fed funds would be about 1.5%. Well, it's about 5.5 now. It's a huge difference. And they said their long term would be 2.5. And they still say that, but we'll see what they put out with the dot plot today. I think they'll still stick to that, but still. It's going to take them some time to get there. Whereas they thought it was going to take them time to get there going up. Now it's going to take them time to get there going down. So it's a, it, it, it's a, it, it, it's a whole situation, right? This week, Blackstone 
Goldman Sachs, if you guys follow the news on commercial real estate at all, they said publicly, we think the bottom's in. We think commercial real estate prices have bottom. We're getting super active right now. And I've been saying this for months because you could follow all this shit, right? So this was an article back in the fall. Wall Street ready to scoop up commercial real estate on the cheap. They had a record 261 billion Wall Street firms built up in dry powder, specifically allocated by distressed commercial real estate. And again, private equity, dry powder sets new record in 2023, 261 billion. And that's grown, actually. There's even more. Every day, there's a new fund getting started to buy distressed commercial real estate because they understand the opportunity here. I've been telling everybody this is coming for over a year. I said, I think it's going to come sometime toward the middle of 2024. I think over these next like 12 months or so, maybe 12 to 18 months, the deals that are bought over the next 12 months or so, anybody who buys these deals are going to look like a genius. Anybody who invests in these deals is going to look like a genius because the deals that are being sold right now, they're only being sold because they are forced to sell. And they're being sold at enormous steep discounts. And because of that, you're going in at a very good going in price and basis. You're reaping the benefits of the prior owner dealt with the flat rent growth and rising expenses. I'm now dealing with, when we get to a year from now, rising rent growth, expenses moderating, interest rates and cap rates going down, values going up. They understand this. Wall Street is not around to lose money. They're around to make money. When they allocate numbers like this, you know, a quarter trillion dollars to scoop up commercial real estate. And again, when they have that much dry powder, they're not buying all cash either. If they buy at 75% leverage, they could buy a trillion worth of distressed commercial real estate if they have 261 billion on hand. So the opportunity is enormous here. And again, to quantify some of the numbers here, 1.2 trillion in commercial real estate debt is troubled. You know, again, uh, 40, 436 billion of this is in multifamily. That's from Newmark. 10 to 11% of multifamily CLOs, you know, collateralized mortgages, um, which is a lot of what the commercial real estate's held in, in Dallas, Houston, and San Antonio mature over the next year. 6 billion in Dallas, 3.7 billion in Houston, 1.4 in San Antonio. Um, 2,500 properties have low maturities by the end of this year. Some of them right now that are maturing are going into default because they can't refi. Again, if you look at my Twitter, I'll, I'll post it at the end here. Uh, big story on that today. Um, 300 plus loans already on, you know, the GSE watch list, meaning they're below one DCR, which means that their income, the property's generating cannot even, you know, service, meaning pay the loan, the monthly loan payment. And then 2,500 total multifamily properties with DSCRs, debt service coverage ratios of 1.05 or less. I talked about earlier, if you took out a loan at four and a half percent and you're refinancing today at six and a half percent, you need a DSCR of 1.81 or higher to refinance. 1.05 or less, you are so screwed. And there's 2,500 total multifamily properties like that. Commercial multifamily, which is five plus units. The majority of those are 50 plus unit properties. So here's the takeaways that I would take away if I were you. Number one, abnormal amount of distress hitting the market in 2024. We're starting to see it already. Number two, the stress is different this time because it's low maturities. I talked earlier, you could have a property, 95% occupancy, paying tenants, you know, everything looks all good in the property, but they hit a loan maturity. They can't sell. They can't refinance because of rates are and where sentiment is in the market right now. They're being forced to fire sale or get foreclosed on. Um, that kind of covers bullet point three as well. Bullet point four, um, we talked about this ad nauseum already, right? So buyers who buy in 2024, you're going to reap the benefit of, you know, projected low new supply once we get towards the end of 2025 and 2026, while rent growth then goes up at that point, expenses moderate, interest rates go down, cap rates go down, values skyrocket. So like, I, to be honest, I could spend three, four hours talking about all this and really get into the minutiae, you know, really, really deep details. But my biggest takeaway from this is that if you've ever held off on investing in multifamily property, you should seriously start looking into analyzing investing in large-scale multifamily properties right now. Whether it be investing passively into somebody else's deal, like deals that me and my partners put together, whether it be putting together a group yourself for you and partners to go ahead and purchase deals, whether it be representing clients and taking advantage of this, or reaching out to some of your clients right now who you know are investors and you know go over this with them, 
And I could send you guys this presentation, by the way. I don't give a shit if you put your names on it and say it's all your information. I really don't care. Um, have fun with it. You know, that's why I have it here. And, you know, and lastly, um, we talked about that already, right? So if you have that, you know, five-year time horizon you buy now and you're like, I'm going to sell in 2028, 2029, you're going to look like a genius. And if you share this information with your clients, you're going to really look smart. Because your client's going to be like, oh, shit, you know, John, Joe, you know, uh, Michelle, you know, Nick, whoever you guys are. I know there's a bunch of people on this. But um, if you talk about this and bring this up with your clients, they're going to see that you're very, very well in tuned with the investment markets. And what's the best part about working with investor clients? Anybody who's watching this, you work with investor clients, do they buy one property a year? No. If they have the ability to buy 100 properties a year, they're going to buy 100 properties a year. If you could speak their investor language and let them know that you're you're in tune with this type of stuff, they're going to value you a lot higher and use you a lot more to represent them in the purchase and sale of investment properties here. Um, and here's just, you know, a final example as far as cap rate compression is concerned, right? If you have $1 million in net operating income on a property right now, and it's selling at a 7% cap rate, which is very realistic, that means you're buying it for about $15.4 million, as you see here. Historically, Income on a property grows 3% annually. So let's say I buy a property this year and I hold it for five years. And every single year, I grow the income a modest 3%. That would be my NOI goes from a million bucks to about 1.16, as you see here. Now, if in five years, interest rates are lower than what they are today, which I think they will be, but we'll see. Here is what would happen based on the cap rates. The value of this income at a 6% cap rate goes from 15.4 to 19.3. At a 5.5% cap rate, 21.1. At a 5% cap rate, 23.2. At a 4.5% cap rate, 25.7. At a 4% cap rate, 28.981. You're buying it for 15.4 roughly. If you could perhaps sell it, let's say even just a 5% cap rate, you're selling it for 23. If on this deal, you go in with modest leverage, you, you take out a $10 million loan, you raise $5 million in equity, your equity in this property will grow from $5 million to, if you sell it for, let's say, $23 million. It, it's going to grow from $5 million to $13 million. Your investor's $100,000 investment is going to go up by you know roughly 2.5x. You're going to take an investor's 100 grand, uh, grand turn it into 250 over the course of five years, they're going to treat you like you're God. Reality is you weren't God. You just followed the data. This data is all public too, which is the crazy thing. Um, we know exactly how many new permits are taking out. It's all public information. So you could project in the future. It's not even a projection. The only projection is the most they can build in a year and a half, two years will be this much. Because when you apply for a permit, there's nobody that can force you to build. So we know the most that could be built in 18 to 24 months and be done. We don't know the least though. We do know the most. And when the most says it's gonna drop off a cliff, you're in good shape, right? So anyway, this is my information here and I'll open it up to questions of course as well now, but that's my website, kovatsmultifamily.com. That's my Twitter account. I think people severely underrate Twitter. I think Twitter is by far and away the best social platform out there. You can learn so much stuff on Twitter and you can talk to so many people who are way smarter than you. I ask people way smarter than me questions on Twitter all the time. And I'll get like a, a housing economists who have like hundreds of thousands of followers like responding to me, like a guy I see on CNBC. I'll send him like a, a reply on Twitter and the guy responds to me like, why is this guy responding to me? It's crazy how much information you get on there. It's not like a mind suck like the other, you know, the social media platforms. And lastly, that's my email there. So um, if you guys, you know, again, if you guys want to be added to our investor database, I could certainly add you to our investor database for deals that we get in the future. Um, if you're interested in investing in deals, I, again, full transparency, we don't have anything now. We haven't bought anything in nearly two years at this point. We just put in offers on properties at numbers that make sense to us and our investors. And if it works for you know the seller, great. If it doesn't, we move on to the next one. Uh, we've been moving on to the next one a whole lot over the past of uh, you know two years at this point. So I'll open it up to questions now and uh, see what questions people might have here. And thank you guys for having me today. I appreciate it. Veronica, go ahead. Yeah, if you guys wrote your email, just email me instead here because I won't be able to copy all these. You can just email me and say, okay. hey, 
share the slides, you know, add me to your investor base, whatever you want me to do. I'm happy to yeah. share the slides. And as I said, you could slap your name on them. You know, you could take my name off. I really don't care. Thank you so much, Ken. Oh, yeah, that, that was one of the questions that I had like 20 minutes ago that you killed it already, like the presentation. The second okay. part is where would you get a 6.5%? Because I, I'm working with a client and they are offering him like 10% or 11%. Yeah, what are they looking to buy? Uh, a multifamily here in Miami. Okay, and how many units? It was a 10 unit. Perfect. Um, so Freddie Mac. Uh, the agency loans are the best loans by far. Um, if you email me, I could send you a couple uh, commercial brokers information. What you, that client wants to do for that 10 unit is they want to use what's called a Freddie SBL. A Freddie SBL is a Freddie small balance loan. Um, super, super good loan terms. You'll get uh, traditionally about take whatever the trip, let's say it's a five-year loan. It's all based on the treasuries. You look at the five-year treasury rate and you would add a spread of roughly between 1.5% to 1.75% to it. So I know the 10-year treasury today was like 4.3, somewhere in that ballpark. So you could probably get a 10-year note loan through Freddie for probably a rate of below six right now, realistically. Yeah, so Freddie SBL, Freddie Mac. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions that anybody has? Yeah, there's one in the chat. Uh, what's your current purchase criteria for multifamily? Yeah, so uh, I would say that the number, you know, a, a number of things. Now I'll talk from a micro, from a macro basis first. Macro basis, I want a landlord friendly area. Um, I want population growth, wage growth, economic growth, the uh, diversity of employment. I don't want just one sector driving the whole market. So I know like some people talk about South Dakota, but South Dakota is so, so oil dependent. That when the oil spigot turns off, that market turns off. Um, so I like diversity of employment as well. Uh, from a micro basis, number one, the number one thing that I think a lot of people oftentimes just kind of overlook is, you know, new supply. I want as little new supply coming to the market as possible. Now, if I was a renter, I would want as much new supply coming to the market because that is going to give me more options and lower my rents. If I'm a landlord, though, I want as little new supply as possible. That's number one. Number two, I want a low concentration of one bedrooms. One bedrooms are the most transient, uh, you know, uh, tenants that you'll have. One bedrooms turn the most. That's what I mean by transient. They turn the most. So you're going to have a one bedroom tenant who, you know, goes off, gets in a relationship and they're like, we want an extra bedroom or you get a, a one bedroom. They have a kid. We want another bedroom. We're going to move out. So ideally, I would like to see less than 40% one bedrooms. I would like walkability to supermarkets and pharmacies. I think a lot of us are privileged as far as like the incomes that we make. But we don't understand that a lot of people don't have two cars in their family. So being able to walk to a supermarket and pharmacy is good. Um, I like good schools. You know, ideally good schools is always, always great to have. Um, what else from a micro basis? I want to go into markets that I have familiarity with. I want to make sure I know the property manager. I want to make sure that if we're intending on doing renovations, that somebody else near the property has already done it and been able to raise rents from that. Um, th th those are a few things to start off with as far as like the basics are concerned. Uh, the, the other, of course, is income. I want to make sure that, you know, we have good tenants in place. Um, ideally, you know, what I'd like to see is that the tenant's income is at least three and a half, uh, 3 3.5 X or more of the monthly rent. Now, what does that mean? For simplicity's sake, if the monthly rent was, um, let's say a thousand bucks, I want to make sure their monthly income is at least 3,500 a month in that case. In that case, you usually are pretty safe and, and you have pretty high, high quality tenants. Uh, I had a question. Um, what do you think of that trend where uh, multifamily owners were taking maybe a building or a floor and subleasing them to like a big shorter term or or midterm rental, like a Sonder or something like that? I, I saw a lot of that. I haven't seen much of that. You know, is there any dovetailing of that with the multifamily and, you know, all the debt coming due and, you know, any creativity around solutions around that? Yeah, that's interesting. Now, we've never done that. The most we've ever done, we actually, we kept our model unit on one of our properties for like three months as an Airbnb. And we were just like, eh, it's not worth it. The juice isn't worth the squeeze there. But um, apparently in Austin, that's big. I just personally don't have any experience with it. I think lenders would probably scrutinize that a little bit too, because a lender wants to make sure that there's, you know, steady income coming in. And I don't know how, um, 
how uh, open lenders would be to that because for lenders, you have to submit documents, you know, every single quarter, you'd have to submit like your rent roll. If my rent roll were to say like 20% of my tenants were concentrated based on like this one individual company, I, I think they wouldn't like that much like how like WeWork has totally screwed the office space, right? WeWork was renting all this office space and they were, you know, the largest concentrated tenant at a lot of buildings. WeWork went out and those buildings sunk and defaulted. So it's interesting. We just personally have not dealt with that uh, ourselves. We don't intend on doing it, but I'm sure some people will, will try to go that route. Yeah. I appreciate your insight on that. Thanks, man. Sure. sure. Thank you. Uh, somebody's saying, do I have a preference between class A and class B properties? Um, class A is always best. You know, you have like the least amount of deferred maintenance and things like that. So I love class A properties. Uh, we, we own both class A and class B. So the majority of our units, 80, yeah, probably 80%, 75, 80% of our units are class A properties, uh, newer vintage, uh, you know, anywhere between 2005 to 2000, uh, 2015 build on our properties. Um, we have one that's an eighties build that I would consider more of class B class B. You're going to deal with more deferred maintenance. You're typically going to deal with a, a different quality of tenant, lower income tenant, as opposed to class A which is higher income, more um, white collar workers, you know, who work from home a lot. Whereas, you know, uh, the class B tenants will be, you know, again, lower income, um, more blue collar tenants, which again, isn't a bad thing, but depending upon, you know, who's living there could be a bad thing. You just, as long as you have the right tenants, you're, you're in good shape. What are my top three states to buy in? Well, I could tell you, I've, I've only bought in two, uh, which is Texas and Arizona, but from like the this data I look at, like the markets right now that are actually like the steadiest is actually the Midwest, which like Indiana, Iowa, I know this sounds weird. Um, they're not traditional markets that you think of, but like those are like the strongest, steadiest markets right now. Um, there's certain parts of Florida that are dealing with like boom and bust right now where a lot of developers came in because a lot of people, you know, moved to Florida and continue to move to Florida. But what happened was they built so much that you have excess supply and you still have good demand. It's just that supply is outstripping demand. So like if, if you're looking for like the steadiest markets, I would say right now, um, the Midwest, weirdly, and believe it or not, Houston, which is odd. We own in Houston, but traditionally Houston used to always be like an overbuilt market. Houston, as far as like percentage of supply that was at it was the lowest of all, four, uh, of all the, you know, largest four Texas metros. Um, so Houston actually has experienced the largest rent growth over the past year between Dallas, San Antonio, Austin, Houston's the biggest, believe it or not. What's the lowest cap rate that I will consider for a purchase right now? Not a loaded question. So the reason I said it's a loaded question is because, you know, I, every situation is different. Like for instance, there's going to be no cap rate on a property that's brand new and full lease up. Like we're looking at a deal right now, a BTR community built to rent single family home community up in uh, in North Texas. Um, 118 units are built, but there's 43 lots that are approved to be built on. Like on that one, it might trade for a lower cap rate because we get the juice of having those 43 lots we want to build more on. So it, it's, it's a hard question to answer, Lance. It's really on a case by case basis. But let's say you're just talking about like a, a steady... Um, you know, occupied property that's stabilized and that, you know, it's just, you're buying a deal, you know, you want to buy a positive leverage. So you'd have to tell me like, what's, what interest rate am I getting on that loan? And what type of quality asset is it? If I'm able to get a 5.5% rate and let's say hypothetically, it's an A-class property built two years ago, it's 96% occupied and it's cranking, you know, I, I'd probably pay a little bit of a premium for it. I'd probably even, you know, buy it five and a quarter or 5.3 and go in negative leverage over the past year with the idea being that in a year, I'll be able to raise income high enough to be a positive leverage. And, you know, again, I feel like I'll get a good deal because the high quality asset. So it's really kind of a case by case basis. Seems like everybody's extremely thrilled with your class. And I agree too. It's really actually cool to, to see things broken down the way they were. Um, so super insightful. Um, we have openings again in July and August, man. So we'd love to have you back. If there's anything else you want to talk about, we we love empowering 30 under 30 members from all over the country. And it's cool to see uh, your network grow. For so, sure. Uh, uh, yo, man, we'd love to, love to have you back sometime. Uh, any final thoughts before we go? 
Yeah, I would just say July, August would be great because by the time August rolls around, we'll have five more months to see exactly how much the stress has hit the market. And um, I think there will certainly be some. So yeah, it could be a good time to uh, to circle back and, and kind of recap on that. Okay, yeah, I'll um, I'll reach out to you after this class is done and we'll, we'll get something set up. Great, thanks, Kevin, appreciate it. And thank you everybody for attending today. Uh, if, if it's okay with you, Kyle, Will, we'll be sending the presentation out next week, recorded, is that cool? Yep, works all good. Awesome. We'll, we'll, we'll give you credit and everything. We'll, we'll make sure your presentation is left untouched for this one, at least. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Perfect. Man. All right. Thanks, Kevin. Appreciate it. Bye. Give up on my way.